I'm your producer, Todd Bartu, and this is the Offshore Explorer. Offshore Explorer looks at the world from the sailor's point of view, port by port. Together, we share stories that detail the important intersections between sailing culture and life, past, present, and future. Let me introduce our host, a lifelong sailor who has traveled the world, from mega yachts to tugboats to ice boats, and a published author who has written for both stage and screen, Captain Scott Dodson. Hello, Todd. Uh, how are you doing today? I know that uh, there are some gale warnings today. So for all your sailors out there in Los Angeles County and and the Bay, um, you better batten down your hatches because it's a blowing. Yeah. Uh, so what do we what do we have uh, planned for today's episode? Well, today uh, I'm doing a, a, another essay, uh, this on um, the nature of a challenge and more specifically the challenge of becoming a sailor. Um, I know we dream a lot. There's a lot of dreamers out there and, and that's a part of it, very much a part of it. That's the first steps to becoming a sailor. And, um, I kind of go through and tell some stories and, um, sort of look at it as a kind of prism and, uh, the different aspects of, of, of becoming a sailor and the challenge that waits, awaits you, um, in the future. Okay, great. Take it away, Scott. I choose these, uh, topics from discussions I generally have with other sailors. Um, I find in general sailors are pretty sophisticated in their self-awareness and their thoughtfulness. Um, I think we all kind of recognize a real sailor. I think there's a lot of people that are in the sail boating industry, in the commercial industry, commercial fishing, uh, operating uh, commercial vessels, uh, whether they're freshwater, saltwater, river water, bathtub water, whatever. Um, they all have one thing in common that they kind of know what a sailor's point of view is. And I say this because sailing is a life. A sailor's point of view is, uh, is as important to culture and country as any philosopher in the universe of sailors. It includes many people and many cultures my wife said to me not long ago, she said, why is sailing so white? And I kind of laughed and I said, well, sailing's white in parts of America. It's kind of what you see in the uh, mega yacht business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you were to take all the sailors in the world, you would find out most of them, I'd say 75 to 80% of them are sailors of color. And think about it for a second. Uh, the United States is a small um, sailing culture, a very effectual culture, but a small sailing culture that's basically been influenced by England and France and Portugal and Spain. But if you go to Africa, there's tons of commercial fishermen there, tons of people sailing, um, in Guinea, uh, in Nigeria. Um, I mean, some really hardcore sailors, um, South Africa as well. It's kind of, it's a mixed culture. I mean, if you go to Mozambique, they have some of the most beautiful dows and people sailing and fishing and sailing, you know, so Africa has this, this great, um, coastal sailing, uh, culture and fishing culture. And that's gone off into its in in the commercial fishing as well, and and people on co commercial boats. I mean, think about the Pacific Islanders. Every single one of those people are almost almost all of them are sailors. Have something to do with the sea. They're fishermen. They 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 sail here. They sail there. I'm going to tell a little story later about being in American Samoa. 
Also, you will think about the Japanese, great culture of sailing, building ships. They're one of the largest shipbuilders in the world. Korea, same thing, great culture, tough waters up there. China, very expansive sailing. Southeast Asia, I mean, after the Vietnam War, all the shrimp fishermen in, in Vietnam um, moved to Louisiana. And now most of your shrimpers in, in Louisiana are from Vietnam. You know, Thai, some Australians, which is a little bit more white, but, you know, still a lot of sailors. But then you go into the Indian Ocean and, and Bangladesh, India, a huge sailing in India. People, you just have no idea until you go there and you just, the number of boats that you see is just mind boggling. And of course, the Arab Peninsula, and you just keep going around the world and finding different places where there's different people of color that are different, um, that sail, that use the ocean in a commercial way or for pleasure or for whatever. But the one thing that's a commonality among all all the cultures and all the people and all the countries is everyone can tell who a sailor is. So the idea of, of you sitting at home and you're thinking about, I want to become a sailor. I want to go sailing. I want to, you know, I want to explore the world, world on a boat, this, that, and other things. So I, I, I push you back a little bit and I, let's start with what a challenge is. Okay. A challenge is something you have to do that's very difficult to do, okay? And becoming a sailor is a kind of challenge, and it has nothing to do with technical knowledge. It has something to do with it, but that's not the whole thing. So you really have to be ready for something to change because it's challenging and it's not something that's staged. If you approach sailing as a kind of, you know, like, oh, this is, a, this is going to be my, my challenge. It's my choice, which I'm not talking about choice. I'm talking about some sort of, of, of live thing in your soul that says, I want to be a sailor. You know, like many people think that uh, it's a challenge to be off social media for a week or... You know, to go hiking with guides and beverages. You know, the sailing world is has its own perceived challenges, like, you know, to sail across an ocean or sail across a lake or, you know, sailing solo for a long distance. These are challenges. Or let's say living on a living on a boat with a maniac at sea. You know. There's buying kit for your boat that you can't be stopped from buying. You know, stopping is kind of a challenge in that sense. Having to decide my wife or my boat, which is really kind of the difference between my reality and my dream. You know, there's an understanding look that a woman can give you that says, you know, I love you, I, I understand you, and, and, you know, I can't participate in this dream. But if you want to change it, come back with me, you can come back with me. I mean, all you have to go to is uh, Tortola. There's a marina in Tortola that's filled with boats that are all ready to go cruising around the world. Where the couple reached that point and it became the wife of the boat. And it's really not the wife of the boat, it's really the wife of the dream. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you haven't committed to what those challenges are to become a sailor, and to live that dream. So the dream is sort of differentiated from you in a kind of normal way. Like, say, for instance, you know, you go to your year, yearly sales meeting in Nebraska. And when all of your colleagues are wearing cowboy hats and talking with a draw, and, and, of course, you're the only person that understands individualism and bravery against all um, th threats and weather and all the rest of the stuff because in your mind you're a sailor and, you know, you can withstand anything, even, you know, 
a meeting with more Dunkin' Donuts and coffee than you can stand. So you use your dream before you become a sailor as a kind of shield or a platform which lets you raise your head and endure what you have to do in the daily grind. I mean, it's no, there's no secret that not every job is the perfect job. You know, it's not a secret that we can convince ourselves to do the job, to go and do the job and be happy about doing the job. You know, we can come home, but it's still a grind. It's still like, this is not, I'm losing every second of my life to this job, which is, in a sense, meaningless, philosophically, morally, maybe even ethically, but the money, the money is providing my life and my family's life and hopefully my family's life on a boat. Of course, a lot of, there's, there's lots of challenges that are essentially self-inflicted. You know, I have quite a few friends recovering from drugs and alcohol, smoking, eating, not eating. Um, there's a host of self-inflicted uh, challenges. And, and respect to all of those who have gone through and continue to go through those challenges. Um, they are real, and facing them is daunting and difficult. And I get it. And that's a, that's a very personal challenge. And that is now beginning to border on that sort of emotional investment, intellectual investment, spiritual investment that will change you and shape you into becoming a sailor. You start at your sailing challenge, and I should say sailing challenge, which is to change you from being a landlubber to a sailor. And you started by reading magazines, yachting, boating, sailing, sailing and cruising, a host of them. And then you commit it to the challenge by learning. You study every detail of sailing, hull shapes, sail plans, types of materials used to build a boat, the history of boats. You marvel at the big boys, the J-class, the mega ships, the schooners. Then the question kind of comes up, what can I afford? And then here comes the adjustment. Rather than drooling over million dollar yachts and developing an attitude about the people who own those yachts, and I will explain to you that the people that own those million dollar yachts were made of two different kinds of people. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But you focus and you become an expert on say smaller yachts. Maybe you're gonna buy a little Catalina just to go sailing, a little coastal sailor. Maybe you can find a used Beneteau or you can find a Genoa or, you know, maybe a Hunter. There's a lot of different, you know, boats, brands, etc. that you can buy that you can treat it as like buying a second home somewhere, you know, but you're going to have to keep working. And it, but it, it'll satisfy only a part of your dream and desire for that challenge of actually becoming a sailor. And then there's the whole, you know, buy a fishing boat. You know, every couple of guys got those fishing boats and, you know, they're parked in the driveway on a trailer and, you know, they like to tool around on the lakes and the rivers. And they're sort of leaning into the sailor, sailor kind of concept. Um, but it's almost a different kind of mindset. And... It can be a part of the dream, um, but it also could be a different part of the dream that you may not think that you want. Because even boaters who choose big power boats packed with a couple of diesels and have ranges, say, 350 nautical miles, have a different dream in sort of patterns. I think back in time when I was in, I was in Turkey, and... Um, I was, I had my boat, I was on the dock, I was, I was running a, um, uh, a Ferretti, um, a Ferretti 90, very attractive boat, very, what I call kind of a fancy Italian middle class boat. You know, it was, it was a little over a couple of million dollars. 
Um, the owner of the boat uh, was looking to get a bigger boat. Um, I had a lot of people come by and look at the boat that, you know, wasn't for sale per se, but, you know, as I always say, every boat is for sale for the right price. And I had a lot of Turkish men come by, look at the boat, ask to come on board, take a look at it, etc. And which I didn't allow. Well, then in Turkey, there was this big earthquake that happened in Anatolia. And a number of apartment buildings fell. And all those guys that were looking for the, for the boats, they had their own boats. They all disappeared from the marina. I mean, literally, the entire marina emptied out. It was remarkable. There was only a few boats left, plus my boat. And I go over, I go back to uh, Rhodes Grace, because I was in uh, Marmaris at the time. And I go back to Rhodes Grace, and I'm just like, kind of like, whoa, this is weird. I heard about the earthquake, and, you know, all these boats suddenly disappear. And they were all in Greece. Turkish flags flying in Greece. It's very common. And I realized what happened is every single one of these guys, these Turkish guys, Turkish businessmen, had something to do in the construction industry that built all these apartment buildings that fell down in an earthquake. So in order to escape liability, they all fled to Greece. This was not their dream, okay? They, they played with the idea of, of being a boater. They played with the idea of being a sailor. But they all escaped and they went across to Greece. So I decided, I, you know, I, I was like completely blown away by this. And they were all very hush-hush, kind of hidden inside their boats and their cabins and stuff. But, you know, I came back, I did my thing, I loaded up the boat, and I went off on a charter. And we went back to Turkey. And it's just, you know, it's like 40 miles. It's nothing, um, especially for a powerboat. And we get over into Turkey and we start going from, you know, place to place to place. And we finally go into um, a place called Gocek, which there's, uh, I have a lot of friends that are from Gocek. And it's one of the great bays to to go sailing in. Um, fantastic uh, Phoenician ruins, uh, beaches. Um, you know, it's it smells fantastic from the pine trees, and it's just it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of earth. But Gocek had had an earthquake as well. Um, back, I th it was like 1979, maybe 78. I remember because I was not there when the earthquake happened. I was back in the Caribbean. And when I came back, everybody was saying, you can't go to go check because it's completely flattened. And they're in the middle of rebuilding it. I eventually did go back, I think the next year, and it was pretty well built back up um, and more or less designed along those ways. But a lot of the guys that I knew who used to run the Goulets, which is a Turkish boat, they're made of uh, basically pine. Um, they throw a diesel engine in them and off they go. Now, a little quick history about that is in terms of being a sailor, most guys uh, that run these goulettes were not sailors. Most of them were not fishermen. Most of them had never been on a boat. When Turkey decided to open up the, the blue coast, as they call it, they put a call out to build these boats, which they built a number of them, and they still do, in Bodrum. And they don't last a long time, um, like you would expect, but they're very functional and they're going to, they set up a whole yacht chartering business with these, these boats. Now, the, the thing is, is that their call for people to drive these boats went out to people that could handle diesels. They wanted bus drivers. They wanted truck drivers. And if you've been in Turkey and you've sailed around, you know that most of the 
Goulet drivers drive like their bus drivers and 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 truck drivers and forget the rules of the road. Don't even think about getting upset because it's their country and they'll do what they want, blah, 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 blah. But the idea was is these sailors, quote unquote, were all truck drivers and and bus drivers, people who could handle diesel engines. And that's how the basic start of the industry, the chartering industry, happened in Turkey and the kinds of people that they put in there. So moving from that, that now, of course, they're generational. They're just generations of people that have been sailing these boats, young people that started out on the boats as maybe assistants or helpers, now have become captains. And there's this tradition that's developed with um, t Turkish men um, about sailing, okay? They're not sailors so much as they're power boaters because a lot of times a goulette will look like it ha it'll have a mast and it'll, it'll have a boom and the boom will look like it's got sails, but in fact, it doesn't have sails. Usually it's just uh, sail covers and it's stuffed with newspaper or they keep their towels in there. Um, they keep their clothes in, in the boom. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's like a place for the crew to keep their clothes. And anyway, so that's what they have, and they don't really sail. There are some boats, goulets, that do um, deploy sails. But for the most part, the smaller boats up to 90, maybe 100 foot, they, don't have, they have no sails. They look like they should, but they don't. They're just big platforms for people to have a party on and to drive the boat. But this has sort of generated a kind of sailor life not the kind of sailor life a guy sitting in Connecticut is thinking about, you know, who sees a J boat go by and, or a guy in Rhode Island who sees a J boat go sailing by or anything else like that. Yeah. These are just like working people that develop themselves into uh, sailors by virtue of what their job is. And I had um, Tim B, uh, Tim B at sea. If you want to go back and listen to that podcast, Tim was pretty much the same guy. He was working in an auto parts store, um, loved uh, sailing, wanted to get in, had a boat, wanted to go charters, a little power boat, and do a couple of things. He ended up going out to sea on a research vessel, uh, came back in and worked his way up and eventually became a tugboat captain. And now he's one of the most respected tugboat captains. And honest to God, he is a very much a true, true sailor. So it is possible. Maybe you don't have the time in your life to do that. Maybe you don't have the money to do that kind of stuff. But there's more of the more different ways to go about getting there. So, you know, if you have a powerboat and you're kind of in that and you're a dream of you dream of powerboats and the luxury and the the room they can afford and you're okay with paying and maintaining the boat. Um, you know, I've run a lot of these big ass boats. Okay. I've, I've run a 160 foot fed ship with a helicopter on the back of it. And these babies, they require planning and a very solid cash flow. Now I have worked with air, with owners, um, getting, you know, in larger boats and they are, regardless of how much money they have, they're always taken aback by the constant drain of cash. And that's when I know I have an owner who is a sailor and an owner who is just showboating. This is just the thing, right? This is just the thing that's their thing. And they use it for different purposes. How you write it off, that's up to you. But I will say I used to have the biggest... Um, some of the richest guys in the world in oil, richest guys in the world in, in paint manufacturing and chemicals, richest guys in the world in television in different countries like in Germany and France, etc. And they would, they would all had boats. They would all come down to their boats. And that was a sort of a, an escape that was their man cave. It was their sanctuary. They'd have the family on, the family would leave. They'd have the girlfriends on. They would have good times, blah, blah. And this was, this was that. They're not sailors. 
they're just using this as an alternate uh, platform in which to be crazy and to party. But when you run into an owner who doesn't mind the constant drain of cash, who loves his boat, who mucks around on the boat, who's always asking questions. I worked for an Argentinian man and his family. They had seven boats. He loved his boats. He loved, he would just go out and he would sit um, on one of the, the seats out on front on the bow and he would sit there and I would drive the boat and he would just sit there and that was his joy. He just loved that. He also went into the engine room. He loved the crew. He talked to the crew. He's incredibly polite. Old money man. Very old money. And even when it was so cold, I mean, he was, he was in his 80s. His children were in their 60s, late 50s. And they were racers. So we used to, I used to have to go to Antigua and, and help them race, race their boats. A lot of cool stuff, but they're real sailors. They love sailing. They 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 went all the way. Or they went into it a hundred percent. But I will say one kind of funny thing is when these really rich people, I mean, they're not you know different than anybody else. But sometimes the whole idea of how much money they're spending sort of hits them in the face. And they go like, oh, fuck. especially new money, right? And and. We were running, I was running a boat with a family uh, from Finland. And the wife, she gets really excited. Um, they're coming down to get on their boat, new boat, at San Lorenzo. And she's coming down and she's got the books. And she's the one that keeps the books. These people have more money than you could believe, okay? They're super rich. And they have a big, big, big business, okay? So she came down and she had found that it was an absence of $15,000 in our boat budget. And she was ready to hang me right there, ready to hang me. And I, I was like, I didn't understand why she was so angry until she explained it to me that there was a gap of $15,000 in my budget. And I said, and I looked across the table and her husband was sitting at her and I said, Oh, this is, this is Marty's wine. And she looked at me and he, she looked at him and he, he like his, his, he almost fell. He wanted to crawl underneath the table because he had spent $15,000 on wine for the boat. Okay. Which we had on the boat. It was there. I had the receipt. I had everything. My budget was right to the penny. No problem at all. But she did not authorize the 15,000 and he did it thinking he could get away with it. And I guess this was a, a point of contention with the two of them about spending money on stuff like wine. And it just goes to show you that in any relationship, I mean, you can get away with murder in a relationship or buying this or buying that, but there's always that one thing. If you buy that one thing, it's like your wife's going to kill you if you buy that one thing, but it's something you really want. And it's hard to not do that. But I say that because then the next thing out of her mouth was after we resolved the $15,000 and she actually apologized for me for accuse, thinking that she was accusing me. All right. She turned to me and she said to me, she said, don't buy the garbage bags that fit in the little garbage cans in the bathrooms. And I said, what? She says, just use the, the, the plastic bags from the market. Don't buy, don't buy the extra ones. I said, okay, no problem. I'll do that. I have, I have, you know, I'll finish those up what I have, and then I'll just use the grocery store bags. Yeah, that's great. Great. Cause we, we can save some money there. Now think about that. Her husband spent 15 grand on wine. They have a five, five and a half million dollar boat they're paying a crew they're spending money on fuel like every time i go to fill up it's like five grand 
right? Every time it's five grand. Boom. Thank you very much. Off we go. And they love using their boat. They love going around. Okay. But she wants to save money on plastic garbage bags in the bathroom. It's insane. But that's the challenge. That was the challenge for them and for their dream. And they both committed to this dream. And they were both sort of starting to border on people of the ocean, people being a sailor. So no matter what kind of economic level you're at, when you enter yachting and boating, all the parameters are the same. Whether you go and you buy yourself a $50 million boat or you buy yourself a, an old Catalina boat for a couple of thousand dollars or a thousand dollars or whatever the case may be. doesn't matter. The question is always, are you able and willing to spend for an idea about yourself? Because not all owners are sailors and not all sailors are owners. Many people don't know this. You may know this, that I wrote a number of films. Um, I'm well known in, in sort of the film writing business, as well as uh, directed a few films. Well known in that, did some commercials. I'm producing two new shows for major network. And I'm, I'm writing those as well, because that's really what I am as a writer. But I had participated in writing a film, and I'm not going to get into whatever, the film, etc. But many years earlier in my career, before I was like full-time on sailing, when I was in that, I'm a sailor, but I've got one foot on land and kind of can't figure out how to make that leap from the land to the boat permanently. Um, and whether I, you know, I had to measure my, um, my desires because I've always wanted to be, I, I, I've always wanted to be a writer. I mean, I, I, I started writing stories. I think, you know, when I could just barely start writing, like I remember writing my first novel in fifth grade and, and going to my mother's, um, and typing it out on my mother's typewriter um, and we used to have a mimeograph. Most of you probably don't know this. This is really dating. But a mimeograph was like you could make copies. So you, you typed on this sort of blue sheet. And it was full of ink and stuff like that. And I typed out a story. It was like a one-page story. And I put in the mimeograph. And I was making... This, is going to be, this was my novel. I was going to do this novel. And I ended up with this, this blue, very blue ink on like every part of my body. And I think I was like in fifth or sixth grade. My mother was just infuriated at me for doing that. But I'd all, I've always been a writer. So I've always had writing. I've always had sailing. So those two things have always been sort of how do I go from A to B and B to C and how do I live both lives and, and, and be successful at both, both lives. Again, I was in... Um, <clears throat> I was in Tunisia. Yeah, I was in Tunisia, in Tabarka, in Tunisia. And the boat next to me, uh, you know, we, we were in the marina, but the boat next to me was uh, filled with a bunch of people. And uh, we, were, we didn't have anybody on our boat. I was, this was me sailing my um, CT-54. And um, we didn't have anybody you know, just a crew and we were in transit, you know, just hanging out, stopped there just to kind of buy some fresh bread and, you know, take a look at what's going on, et cetera. And that's the, uh, part of that's part of the, you know, this is like my return after the great, uh, camel desert ride that I had, had talked about in my other, uh, podcasts. So we're sort of talking, and, and there was a couple of guys that I didn't know who they were. And we're just, you know, chit-chatting this, that, and other thing. And, 
you know, leaning on the rail as you do when you're, you know, a boater and talking to people and this, that, another thing. And, and by this time I was pretty firmly implanted as a sailor and sailor personality. And I had discovered, you know, what it, what it was to be a full-time sailor. And I discovered the nuances and the notions of the way I had to think to become a sailor, the way I wanted to think as a sailor, and the, my perceptions of what it, myself as a sailor. So one of these guys comes over and he says, are you Scott Dodgson? I said, yes, I am. He said, we met before. You got to understand, I'm in Tunisia, Africa, okay? And here comes a guy who says, yeah, we met in New York. I said, no kidding. And I, I, I thought he was somewhat familiar. And we, and we started to talk, and I suddenly realized right off the bat who he was. It was Mac Davis. Some of you will know who Mac Davis is, some won't, but Mac Davis was a very, very popular singer had a television show called the Mac Davis show, et cetera, et cetera. And so we just, we started to talk. Yeah, you were in New York. You had that. It was a premiere. It was a movie. We met, uh, remember my wife, she was an actress. You know, we went through this whole thing. It was like doing it. And he was, Mac Davis was a big deal for a long time. And this is just over the rail kind of comp, right? So the next thing he goes around, he starts telling everybody, yeah, this guy's a famous writer. He's also the captain of that boat. So here, suddenly my identification as a sailor became my writing identification. And I wanted to embrace both of these, but I wasn't really capable of embracing the writer. I, I was so comfortable in being just a sailor. I was so comfortable in just my engine maintenance and my varnishing and, you know, repairing my sails or, you know, doing anything on the boat and sailing here and sailing there. I was going to leave Tabarka and I was going to sail to Gibraltar. And from Gibraltar, I was going to sail all the way down to the Canary Islands. And from the Canary Islands, it's going to go across and I was going to be in Antigua and I was, I was going to do this and this and this. And this is what my path was. This is what my sailing sailor path was. But I had to figure out how to, to, to be in both worlds at the same time, from going from just a nondescript sailor that everybody knew who I was to suddenly a sailor that was also a celebrity writer. So the challenge for a novice in going into this world is a question of immersion and giving up that thing that you've identified yourself with. Now I've run across a lot of people that like to call themselves sailors and they have certain behaviors that are very sailor-ish and I, you'll recognize them. You know, the guy who knows every technical detail and every mechanical part on a boat, right? Um, who will argue with you um, until the sun sets um, about, you know, 12 volt, 24 volt, whatever, right? Um, whatever the argument is on, on the batteries or, or where your car should be so that your, you know, your low, your luff is, is, taunt and shapes of sails and they'll go through all this stuff and then there are the historians who love to trace like the designers and historical restoration of projects you know who know like oh yeah this is you know this was built in 1843 and it's you know by this Neustrom da 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 and da 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 and and it's it's like collecting stamps. It's just collecting ideas. Then there are builders, people who just love building and refurbishing boats. And as I said, you know, um, in one in my most recent, uh, just in case, you know, about the man who built Steppenwolf, you know, my boat when I was young, that he didn't like sailing. He he simply liked 
building boats. And that had to have been one of the most honest appraisals of one's self that I think I'd ever, ever seen in my life. And I know for a 16-year-old boy or 15-year-old boy, 15 and a half, I should say, that being able to see that it's important to be true to yourself and that you have to admit, like, hey, I built a boat. I hate sailing, but I love building boats. I love being around sailors. I love being around the whole sailing kitsch, but I don't like sailing. And that's actually okay. That's okay. But all these people kind of like are kind of part sailor or have an interest in being a sailor. But the challenge that I'm talking about is to become that figure who is standing on a rolling and pitching deck and whose outlook and philosophy of life starts with wind and water. So the question is, is how does one become a sailor? One part of it is experience. Just sail. Be on the water as much as possible. But it isn't the only thing. You know, there's a lot of um, sailboat racing. A lot of people go out racing sailboats. Most of them are not sailors. I look at them basically as sportsmen. Some are sailors. Don't get me wrong. Um, but a lot of them are, are just sportsmen. They just they want to go out. They want to race. They want to be a part of, a, of an exciting time. Right? Um, but they're not the sailor sailor I'm talking about. And there, you know, there are sailors amongst the racers, no doubt. Okay. And some very, very good sailors. And some people that really get the whole concept. But they've made it their life and their job to understand how to make boats go fast. Oddly, and I'm sure you intuitively know who they are, sailors. You can always tell. Sailors, you know, they're, they're recognized by their state of being, by the privilege they've gained from hardship, by the experience of Mother Nature's profound natural challenges, by the respect of Mother Nature, by the respect that real sailors possess for all sorts of people who work and play on the water, who combine, you know, respect for the water, a sense of wonderment for the land. They respect this. They respect the people on the land for what the land can offer, from what they could discover. I was in Samoa, America's Samoa, and it was one of the great reaches in my life. I was very young. And I met, I, w I went to a bar, I came in there, and I, they have a nice marina in there, and lots of fishing boats, and just the whole atmosphere is just amazing. It still has a sense of America, to be honest, really. You know, when you see road signs that are the same as you would find in Nebraska, it's kind of like, did I really travel, you know, 10,000 miles? Um, it's kind of weird in that regard. So anyway, I was sitting in this, this um, bar, beach bar kind of thing. And, you know, Samoans are, are um, big people, you know. Um, this is not a place where fat shaming will work at all. They would kill you. And I, this girl was talking to me. She was so cute. She was so nice. And we we're both about the same age. But she was, she was Samoan. And she was very, very thin. And she was really, by my standards of beauty, my American standards of beauty, she was 
she was right up there. She was top 10, easy. Very pretty, very nice, very open, very kind. And I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at her, I'm talking to her, we're getting along, and she's saying like this, and she's saying that. And then the bartender comes over, who was her mother, who was at least 350 pounds, or whatever the case may be. And she looks at me, and she says, Hey, sailor boy, what do you want to do with the, that's the runt of the family. Why don't you come over here and talk to my oldest daughter? <laughs> And her older daughter was a big woman too. And, but this was the runt of the family. And at that very moment, I realized that my preconceptions that I carry with me can be extremely damaging. And they could be damaging to you in your normal life, your land life. You think you know the way the world is. Well, you're wrong. You know something about it. You know somewhere, somehow, you know a little bit that you can navigate the world, but you don't know the world. So this whole arrogant idea that I know this and I know that and I know this, it's just, that's just like you deluding yourself. Sorry, don't have time for you. But I realized at that very point that my desires to, to chat up this beautiful, thin Samoan girl was viewed in that community as 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 wrong that i should be talking to this beautiful um fulsome woman at the other end of the bar i ended up actually talking to her and the two girls and the mother the father came over we had a wonderful time we went out actually and they were having a um like a luau basically and um, they had uh, some pork that had already been cooked, and it was. They invited me to go sit to table, and well, um, they were drinking beer and and eating pork and all the rest of the stuff. The girls kind of disappeared. I ended up sitting with a bunch of guys, and they talked about sailing and they talked about fishing and you know what's out here, what's out there. You got to watch this reef. That reef is kind of hidden. You won't see it until you get right to it, but you can't cross it. So back up, you know, they went through all sorts of wonderful conversations about this, that, and other thing. And the fact that they kept reminding me that they are Americans. Yeah, we're Americans, just like people from California. We go to California all the time. We get on the plane. We go to California. Our kids go to school there. You know, one kid, one family, oh, yeah, my son's at Michigan. It was like, wow. Who would have thunk it? A little boy from northeast Philly sitting in American Samoa having his entire perceptions of the way people look the way people talk, of the way people live, completely crushed, rattled, and rebuilt again. And you know what? A sailor accepts this kind of notion. And every time he does, in a kind of imperceptible way, the effects change him or her shaping them so when you see a real sailor you are seeing thousands of tiny changes that have been sculpted into his or her being they are in a sense a walking piece of cultural art thank you Thanks for sharing, Scott. So what would you say was your biggest challenge? My biggest challenge? Oh, endurance. Um, it's always a challenge. I, I think when I was sailing, especially long distance sailing, I was uh, very happy. Um, I was very pleased. I, I didn't mind the trip would take a day longer or two days longer or or whatever. It's just the anxiety you would get on land 
um, you know, sitting in a traffic jam and you've got to get to work or whatever, uh, that never occurred to me. That was never a challenge. That was never a challenge. But it, to answer your question more specifically, I would say the real challenge was developing my self awareness and my openness so that I could recognize those prejudices and, um, you know, not that I'm a bigoted or prejudiced friend, uh, not at all. I'm just just saying that there's certain things. Oh, I like it this way, or I like it that way. Um, I, I opened myself up to seeing things um, the way other people see them, and then I've just adapted whatever I need to adapt to my own um, my own life in a positive way. Yeah, I like that concept of. You know, a challenge is, is not necessarily something that you choose for yourself. It's something that you have to do. It's something that is thrust upon you, you know. Like a, like we said, uh, you know, eating a plate of nachos, while it might be challenging, is not a challenge. <laughs> no. No, there are things that are challenges. You know, obviously, that's a challenge. But the the real challenge we're talking about, especially in sailing, is 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 something that you have to do. Um, and a lot of times, sometimes you don't like to do it, but you have to do it. So um, I think most people that do become sailors uh, for a long time, it's, it's actually an imperative. I have known guys who, were, um, who got jobs as, as, as commercial uh, maritimers. Uh, working on big ships, on container ships, and stuff like that, and it would for them in the beginning it was a job, but after a few years, even a few months, they were completely sailors. I mean, they were just that—that that was their thing. They got it, and it. And I'll look at how that happens a little bit more later, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a really fascinating um, thing that exists, and and I would love to hear from people out there um listeners if your thoughts on the on the subject so yeah definitely we'd love to hear from our listeners so what do we have planned for next week's episode um i'm going to get into something that uh, a lot of people know about and a lot of people have 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 read the books have obviously seen the movie and that's the patrick o'brien uh jack aubrey series you know master and commander and and the Ionian mission, the far side of the world, uh, you know, all the rest of the good stuff that's in there. And um, I have a couple of stories uh, that are related to the writing of uh, Patrick O'Brien. I actually tried to go see Patrick O'Brien once, um, but he, he was out. Um, I think he was in England or something. Uh, he lived in the he lived in the south of France, and there's a couple of interesting passages in the books which I will re- relate, and um, they're actually uh, places that were kind of literally outside his house, so <laughs> that were wow. that were written. It's kind of interesting, and so anyway, there's there's tons of good stuff, and there's lots of fans of Patrick O'Brien, and um, considered the greatest historical novelist of all times. And that's by the London Times, New York Times, The Post, and a variety of other people. So we'll get into that. Thank you for tuning in. If you liked this episode, be sure to leave us a review. You can find past episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Facebook and offshoreexplorer.org. Our theme song is sung by Paulette McWilliams, with additional music by Amano Itomi and Tommy Twain. Until next time, fair winds and calm seas. <laughs>